Can we put our hands together and give God the glory this morning? We worship you, God. We bless you. Amen. Well, today is uh, Communion and uh, Mission Sunday. Uh, we'll be uh, having two uh, privileges for you to worship God and giving. Number one is this, we'll be having uh, once a month the, uh, the mission giving, which is afterwards. But uh, we will be uh, giving an opportunity to worship God in uh, your tithes and offering this morning. So while you're preparing for that, let me just welcome those that are here for the first time. Can we give God glory for the first timers? God bless you. Amen. God bless you for, uh, for coming tonight, today, and I pray that you will be blessed. And all those also that came back from, uh, from several weeks, maybe last week, I know I, I see a couple of people that came back. Can we give God glory for them, please? <laughs> Amen. And those just came back from vacation. Now, if you see someone that's a little bit uh, you know, happy, uh, they just came back from vacation. All right, we welcome you back. I know we have Gibson and, uh, and Brandon. All right, the future doctors. Amen. God bless you. Anybody else that just came back from vacation? I know some people, when I ask them, they don't raise their hand because I know I'm going to ask them, what do you have for me? What did you bring for me? Yeah? So they, uh, they kind of a little bit, uh, um, they don't want it. But they'll share later on. Amen. So why don't we stand, please, if you, if you can, and we'll pray, and we'll give you an opportunity to worship God through our tithes and offering. Can we do that? God bless you. Lord, again, we thank you so much. As always, we have come before you. We ask God that you will bless your people as they come and give their substance to you, the tithes that belongs to you. And I pray, God, that you will continue to prosper each one of us as we make sacrificial giving as well. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone will say, Amen. Amen. We invite you, please, to come and just uh, give your tithes and offering unto the Lord. remain standing if you can and we will pray for God's blessing. Lord again we thank you so much. We have given our substance to you as you have said in your word we can challenge you you can prove it to us that if we give our tithes back to you our offering to you that you will open up the floodgates of heaven. So as your children of God I ask you that you will prove yourself open up the floodgates of heaven where our blessings come from. Promotion, health, healing, restoration, and financial breakthrough be upon each one of us as we give sacrificially, willingly to you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Never will say, Amen. Please don't sit down as you are standing. Would you please open your word to Luke chapter 18, starting verse 9 through 14. As you are standing, uh, let's read our word this morning. Luke chapter 18, starting verse 9 through 14. A very familiar part of scripture. It is our communion uh, um, word today. And so Luke chapter 18, starting verse 9 through 14. And Jesus Christ says, And he spoke a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And it says in verse 10, a parable says here, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee and the other one is a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And it says, God, I thank you that you, I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
and the tax collector standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus Christ says this, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. As we prepare our hearts this morning, help us to understand your message. Holy Spirit, I ask you that you will put the right words in my lips, and I pray, God, that you open up the, the, the ears and the heart of your people as they, well, so that they, they can receive their portion today. And I also pray for those that are going through difficulties in their lives, distractions, commotions. I pray, God, that you will allow them to be settled in your presence so that they will be nourished. Lord, we thank you for today, and thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and everyone will say, Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Today is Communion Sunday, and as always, if you've been, if you've been going to churches, we will always try to tailor it so that our hearts will be receptive. The title of the message is very simple, The Pharisee and the Tax Collector. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, I'll just give you a summary of the outline. Number one is this. There were two men. Um, I checked. There were two men, two prayers, and then the result was different. And, uh, okay, my friend, uh, don't, just stay, stay with me. Pull back. <laughs> All right. So there are two men. There are two men that... That, that, that were considered as the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they say in the word that they are both churchgoers. Today we are going to learn about humility that is presented before God, humility in the presence of God. It is my understanding that when we begin to exalt ourselves, as the word of God says, he humbles us. Uh, two different men, churchgoers, they fear the Lord, they know God, but there's something different about these two men. One of them, uh, you would find out, he's a Pharisee. Now, Pharisee is the religious uh, uh, group during Jesus Christ's time. In our time now, we have different uh, political um, parties, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Libertarians, and others. Uh, the similarity ends there. In our time now, what they have done is that they pulled out God in, uh, in, 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 a, in a religious background. So. Uh, aside from that, the Pharisees, what they have done is that they are political, they are powerful, and so therefore, they actually put the political realm and the religious realm together, and they become Pharisees. The Pharisees are very strict. They are very, very, they follow the Torah, and they, they actually, every day of their lives, they, they, they seem to say, God, I need to follow you. And that becomes a religious um, attitude. In other words, the Pharisee, when you are called a Pharisee, you are top of the line. In Jesus' time, when you are called a Pharisee, you are the person that is, that, that is seen as authority, the one who knows the word, the one who, who memorizes, the one who memorizes, the one who lives by it, try to, and everything that you see uh, that they do. So therefore, if there's a choice between, um, between a person, a Pharisee would be, someone that they will look up to, the Pharisee. The Pharisee are also known for their knowledge of the law. Now sometimes, if you're not careful, if our knowledge just stay in our head, it doesn't go to our heart, then we become religious. Some say amen. In a church setting like this and any other churches, there are people that would come to church uh, that would like to learn more about God. Perhaps they're they're what they call, they're, they're uh, seeking the truth, they're seeking information, or they're just trying to check mark uh, every Sunday that I've done, I'm good, all right? Now, the other person is a tax collector. A tax collector is considered uh, a person of, uh, if, you're, if you're during Jesus Christ's time, you are what they call the scum of the earth. Several things. Number one is this. A tax collector is a person He's an extortioner. Uh, in other words, there's a certain amount of taxes that are, uh, that are, uh, th that are uh, billed by the Roman Empire, 
And the tax collector has a privilege to take more, not for other people's sake, but for his own. When you are a tax collector, in other words, you are also not a patriot, or you are what I call uh, someone that is not loyal to Israel. Why? Because the Roman Empire found you as a man who will what? Who will who will uh, be uh, um, uh, uh, will be beneficial to the Roman Empire. And so when you see a tax collector, uh, he's a person that is low in, in the status of the uh, Jewish life. As a matter of fact, a tax collector is so bad that if you go to the law, his testimony cannot be substantiated. In other words, his, a tax collector's testimony is thrown out. Can you imagine that? <laughs> If you're a witness to a, a, a situation, if you're a tax collector, they will throw you out. Why? Because you cannot be trusted. Think about that for a moment. If you are, if you are in that situation, you don't have any more. You are what I call the bottom of the sleepers of the Jews as they're walking, the dirt. And so these two people, one is a Pharisee and one is a tax collector. If you've also been reading the Word, you've noticed that when Jesus Christ and the other says, and the sinners and tax collectors came to Jesus. Look at this, how they actually categorize a tax collector's life. They would, the Word would say, if you read it, it says, and the sinners and the tax collectors went to Jesus. And the sinners and the tax collectors came up to Jesus. In other words, when you're a sinner, they didn't even categorize, and the, and, and the adulterers and the extortioners and the sinners went to Jesus. No, it's always the sinners and the tax collectors, in other words. All right? They are the scum of the earth. Now, the second thing is this. The part two is this. There's a different prayer. So look at the prayer of the, uh, the Pharisee. The Pharisee says this. He expressed his... Um, yeah, there you go. The prayer of the prior says, he thanked God that he's not like the others. In other words, he says, special extortioners or even the tax collector nearby. He recounts his good deeds. I fast twice a week, and also I give. I give my tithes of all that I possess. Now, in the law, you don't tithe everything. You only tithe a portion. But this Pharisee tithes everything, 10%. And then he says here, so, so I fast twice a week. The minimum that the law requires is that you only fast once a year. All right? But this one, he fast twice a week. And so therefore, they approach God, but the approach were different. The Pharisee who knows about the law approach him in a way that seems to be, you know, a uh, portraying that he has the merit or he earned the privilege to approach God. Lord, here I am. Look at me. I haven't killed anyone. I haven't said anything bad. Here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not like others. Have you felt like sometimes you, you know, if you earn and you have been promoted to a status and Perhaps you're driving a better car than the others and you feel like you made it and, and for some reason that the pride of spirit. See, God says, um, God does not like the proud. His heart is closer to the humble. What is the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector? The second part, the prayer of the tax collector and he says here he was out in the back the Pharisees on the front perhaps he heard this he heard how the Pharisee have maligned him what did he say instead of expressing rage instead of expressing I'm gonna get you I can buy you what did he do he expressed his repentance and humility and what he did two things he went back and he says he would not even so much look up 
See, in the culture, I'm not sure about the Western culture, in the Eastern culture, when you are repentant or if you have done something that is, that is bad and you got caught, most of the time, you will look down. No, in, in a way that you are saying, I'm sorry. The tax collector couldn't even look up because he's so ashamed. He knows about who he is. He knows where he comes from. Probably he knows what he's doing. And then we approach God. He heard every time that he probably would walk by, tax collector, tax collector. Can you imagine that? This also proves that everything that we have, a substance, will never satisfy us. Most of the time when people approach Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ touched them from the very core of their being. An acceptance, forgiveness, restoration. This tax collector was afar off, and if you could probably hear, Lord, and he said this, and he beat his chest. Why? The heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. That's why I guard your heart. That's because of his, in the, the, the context of his heart. See, the heart has to be guarded. The heart has to be so guarded that it can be corrupted. And so in a way, he's saying, God, he says this, in his anguish and his sin, he was calling upon him and says, I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. What's the difference? Number one, the difference is this. The, uh, the Pharisee came up, man, I'm okay. The other one came, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Now, that, what's the result? The result is this. The tax collector go, goes home justified. The word justified there means just Christ found him not guilty. In other words, all the things. See, the thing is this. You know, they say that when you repent before God, he sees you. And when he sees this man, he went home justified. He was restored. The Pharisee, on the other hand, goes home with what? Nothing. He had his price. He was seen by others. He was seeing how good he was, how, how good with his word is. But other than that, he was seen. Jesus Christ says this, I assure you, they have their word. What is that reward? He was seen by others. Now, which one is more important then? To be seen by others or to be tasked by Jesus Christ and clean you up so that when you go. See, my friend, there are many people that go to church every Sunday and they are the same. There's something about going to church. Now, we are the church, the Bible says. I am one of the church, you are the church, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But when we come together in a place like this, we become the church. When you and I attend a church service, just what you call it, if the word doesn't penetrate our hearts and there's no change in the way we think, the way we live, Something is radically missing. You and I must be changed regardless of how much or how little. It has to be a change. See, the enemy wants us to be condemned. See, as we look upon God, the enemy is condemning you. Don't you remember this? The Holy Spirit brings a conviction clothed in love. Amen? The Holy Spirit will bring a deep, deep conviction in each one of us, but it is enveloped in love. That love is not the phileo, it is not the erotic, it is the agape love. It is the love that says, for God so loved the world that he gave. So when you go to church, when I go to church, when you attend church, there has to be something that will bring you into a change. Otherwise, you missed out. We missed out 
on what it is to hear the word of God. Now, in this, let us apply the word, okay? Let, let's apply this. Here's the thing about the three things that Jesus Christ wants us to understand about humility and pride. Number one is this. Jesus warns us against self-righteousness. The Pharisee says this, that he trusted his own good work, but it was to no avail. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says this, But we are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We are all fate as leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. In other words, God, Jesus Christ himself, is, is warning us about being self-righteous. What did he say? I am not like this tax collector. Self-righteousness is like a disease that makes you feel that you are better than others. The second one is this. He warns us against arrogance. The other term for arrogance is to be prideful. The Pharisee despised others, including the tax collector. Look at this. Proverbs 8.13 says, All who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. In other words, pride. Did you know that somebody says this? Pride is like a disease that everyone sees except the one that has it. Pride is like a disease that everyone sees it except the one that has it. Pride comes before destruction. Christ himself says he's close to the humble and resent those that are prideful. Jesus Christ himself. And the third one is this. Jesus teaches the value of what? Humility. Now, it's not about the false humility that we feel that we, we, we subject ourselves. Humility is having that meekness of the heart. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the people whose vile your core that can actually be prideful, and yet they would descend themselves into such that they don't have anything to prove. Isaiah 57 verse 15 says this, uh, says here, For thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the one that I contrite. In other words, Jesus himself is always close to the humble. Now, humble doesn't mean that you will have everyone step on you. No, humility is like a stallion, a stallion that has a brute force that is actually content or constrained by the power of God. Humility is having the ability to control or to say, I can do it, but I will stand down. Humility is when you feel that you have been betrayed, but you feel, no, I'm not going to what? I'm going to take the high road. Humility is when God sees you. The Pharisee could have him because he knows the law, but he doesn't know the lawgiver. The tax collector doesn't know actually who he is, but he says, Lord, I, you know me. I am. And the third and that one says in Isaiah chapter 66 also says this. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple and God as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? My hands have made both heaven and earth. They are and they everything in them. The eye of the Lord has spoken. I will bless those who are humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my words. I will bless those that are humble in their hearts. Now, if you have a choice, which one would you want to be? The one that is blessed or the one who got nothing? Of course. The question that we have to ask is this. Next one, please. Psalms 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have broken and saved us such as a contrite heart. He saves them. And the next one is this. It says here, How will you go home today? Now, I pose that question because the two people, churchgoers, went to the temple. And it says here that as they prayed, one of them went home and nothing. But the tax collector that has come to earth went home justified. The question I need to pose for each one of us, 
how will you go home today? How will you go home today? Would you be one? Would you want to be what? Justified? Would you want to be forgiven so that your heart will be what? Will be nurtured. If we go home without being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing with the word. There's nothing wrong with the one preaching the word. It is the state of our hearts that God wants to change. He wants you to be blessed, but not at your own turn. He wants you to be blessed, to be forgiven of our sins. Look at this, the next one. It says here, Psalm 51, verse 13. This is the cry of David. It says here, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sins are always before me. Do you know, you and I know, that everything can be forgiven, but those that are not confessed before God. So you don't have to go to someone to confess your sin. God knows our makeup. God knows our failures. And that's why the psalmist says this, my sins are always what? Before me. Our sins that we have done in the past. Now God has given us this magnificent invention or uh, by called the brain. The fastest, the most la- long-lasting computer ever created by man. The brain is created by God. The things that we have learned from when we were born up to the point now, everything is what? is stored in our memories. The things that we have done, either bad or good, they will never be erased. They're there. So that, that is our memory. The enemy will always remind you of your past. It will always remind us of our past. But the Holy Spirit will remind us from where we were so that he can take us from that point into a place of recognition and acceptance. David cried out, Lord, cleanse me from my sins. David, of all men, would have been taken out by God He's a warrior. He committed adultery. He committed what? Murder. And when he was approached by the prophet, says, you are that man, David the king, says, forgive me. And most of the psalms that he wrote were because of his nature of God saying, God, I am a sinner before you. Cleanse me. The best of those that God has given to them has to do with repentance. Why? Because he was just a shepherd boy and he was taken from there into a place of authority. And even now, if you go to Israel, they would say, David, who is the king, was taken out. He is most highly acclaimed because he was the king who confessed that he's a sinner. Next one is this. John chapter 1, John 1, 2, verse 1, 4 says, My dear brother, says, children, I am writing this to you that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Who's our advocate? Jesus, our case before the Father. He is Jesus, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones our sins, and not only our sin, but the sins of the world. Look at that for a moment. The Pharisee came with his own self-righteousness, and it was not accepted. The tax collector came on his own saying, God, forgive me. And Jesus Christ says he was justify it is my prayer that before we take communion this morning that if there's anything in your heart you perhaps you've done says I don't qualify perhaps you said man I've done so much in my life that I have to clean up before I approach God if you feel and you think that you have done so much that God cannot forgive you. If you have seen, done, or have thought of, that say, I don't qualify, can I say this to you? I'd like to congratulate you. You qualify for God's forgiveness. You qualify for God's forgiveness because that, those are the people that God is looking for 
Jesus Christ says, I came to seek and save those who are lost. I consider that. I am part of that. And God gave me the privilege to be adapted into the kingdom. I'd like to pray with you, with us today, before we partake of the communion. If you sense, God, there's something in my heart that, that I've been keeping, and, and I want to let go of this, of my, of the penalty of my, of my, of my deeds from the past. Perhaps you say, would I be religious enough? I've run away from you, and I'm trying to patch by my good works, just like the Pharisee. I want to settle down now. I want to to be forgiven of my sins. The Bible says this, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, everyone has sinned. Romans 6.23 as well says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, you know who we are. We have come into your church, in your sanctuary. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing that we can hide from you. We heard your word. I don't want to be the Pharisee. I want your forgiveness. So I confess today that I'm guilty of separation from you. I want to be set free from the condemnation of my past. Jesus, I repent of all my sins. Forgive me. I ask you to cleanse my heart from all bitterness, from all hatred. I ask you, Lord, that I will release forgiveness to all those who have maligned, abused, misused, mistreated me. And just like the tax collector, I cannot even look at you. You see the depths and the width of my sins. I present them before you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And I open my heart. accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Let me pray for you. Father, today, this communion Sunday, you, you have orchestrated this time for each one of us to come to hear your word. And we will live this place changed by the power of the Holy Spirit because you have dealt with us with your compassion, with your love. And I thank you by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ and the atonement made by you as well. Our sins are forgiven. Our sins are washed away. And we are justified, not because of our own work, 
but because of what Jesus Christ has done. So I pray, God, that you will give us a new path to travel. Give us the desire to know you more as we read your word, as we fellowship, as we worship you, as we tell others about you. Lord, would you continue to protect that seed of salvation that you have placed upon your children and you have adopted us as your children. I speak blessings upon each one of us today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Praise God. Can we put our hands and give God glory? May I call on the ushers, please, to come? Every first Sunday of the month, we gather together to partake of communion. We call it the Lord's communion or the Lord's table. And there's a reason why it's called the Lord's communion. It is His communion. It is free. Everyone is, is welcome, but as we have prayed, you have to be a son or daughter of the King. What you have prayed, and you are welcome to partake. We will partake of them together, and as they present it to you, take a moment to reflect upon the goodness of God. Amen. Lord, again, we thank you for the emblems presented before us, the bread representing the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fruit of the vine representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ. May we continue to live a life acceptable to you and pleasing. In his name we pray.
If you can, please, would you stay, stand on with us? In the night, Jesus Christ was about to be betrayed. He took a piece of bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to Simon and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you so much that you gave Jesus Christ on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, for your obedience to the cross. Our shame was nailed to the cross. Holy Spirit, we thank you for continually reminding us that we are sinners saved by grace, adopted into your family. Thank you, God, for your great love for each one of us. In Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, let us all partake the emblem of the bread representing the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. After which the same manner, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, took a cup and he blessed it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, drink, this is the cup, new covenant, the blood that will be shed for you and for all men, so that their sins will be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. Father God, we thank you so much that even in the old covenant, you have shown your love through the blood of the Lamb. In the new covenant by Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, His blood was shed once and for all for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for without the shedding of His blood, there's no forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Jesus, for your obedience. Thank you for taking our sins and nailing nailing them to the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us until the end of time. We bless you, give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone say amen. Would you please partake of the cup representing the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you just lift up your hands and just thank him personally? Father, I thank you. We are so humble and grateful. Thank you so much for your forgiveness. Help us, oh God, to continually live a life that is pleasing before you. A humble heart, humility, for you said in your word that you resist the proud and give grace to the humble. So I pray, Father, on behalf of your children that you will continue to work by the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of servanthood, the spirit of humility, the spirit of obedience and submission to the will of God. And thank you today. You have given us the privilege to partake of the Lord's table. And we give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone will say, Amen and Amen and Amen. Put your hands, please, and give God the best clap.